Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This week, in our evening Bible study, we watched the movie Leap of Faith. I know, sometimes we don't just stick to watching, reading the Bible right through, and we actually have a little fun. This week, the fun was watching Leap of Faith. Has anybody ever watched Leap of Faith, other than the people in the Bible study? The old Steve Martin movie? Um, Steve Martin, and actually, a bunch of big-name actors are all in that movie. It was actually a movie I grew up watching because my parents love Steve Martin, and they, we watched all of those old Steve Martin movies, The Jerk, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, Leap of Faith. Anyway, in Leap of Faith, Steve Martin is a traveling preacher named Jonas Nightingale, and he has this big revival sort of uh, convoy, and they drive around the country, um, and it's, but we find out early in the movie it's just a big con. He's just trying to, um, doing these revival shows to make money and using God as the centerpiece. Um, Thank you, Jesus, is a big line he uses. And so the movie begins with one of his big tractor-trailer trucks uh, kind of breaking down, and they wind up in this little small town of Rustwater, Kansas. And they say it's not the type of place that Jonas normally plays, but because they have nothing else to do, they set up shop and do the show. Now, Jonas' shows are marked um, by this big, huge gospel choir, big tent, um, a full band with Meat Loaf as the organ player, um, a giant Jesus on the cross, crucifix behind everybody, um, complete with a black starry sky um, under tent covering paint job. Um, quite the show, quite the spectacular show. And so the movie takes opportunity to sort of poke fun, maybe a little bit, at this sort of dynamic Pentecostal revival sort of thing that has marked America's history and America's past. Um, every part of the, sh- there's parts of the show where Jonas does his preaching moments and he's I'm always feeling like these healing moments coming upon him, like, oh, people, I feel a healing coming on. I I feel like God wants to do a healing in this place, and he has these moments. And then he runs around the tent, and he pretends to, like, know what's on people's hearts and minds and heals them. But meanwhile, you see the background as his hawkers are going around meeting people before the show and finding out, like, who can't hear. So they'd find out that, uh, you know, that maybe Jeff has trouble with his hearing, I know, it's a, it's a stretch for you. Just bear with me for a moment. And so they'll let him know that the guy sitting in the front row in the left section has trouble with his hearing. And so Steve Morton will be like, and brother, you have, you have problems with your healing, right? And people are like, oh, how does he know that? And then he'll put his hands on their ears, and it's all very dramatic and big. And, um, and so that's the shtick for Steve Morton and his group. Um, but there's another part of the show, which is kind of a, a they poke fun at us Christians, um, and it, it's Jonas's regular pushing of this get saved theme. In one of his revival speeches, Jonas tells a story about a man named Thomas, and I won't do the whole speech he does, um, but as with many of these types of stories, Thomas has all the worldly stuff, things should be great for him. Um, He has a fancy house, everything's going right, the big job, but as these stories go, Jonas, or uh, Thomas, things aren't really that great. He's sad, he's scared, he's nervous, he's got fear in his life, Um, he's just not happy. And so he finishes, Jonas does, in telling this story of Thomas, that Thomas figures out what's wrong with his life. He just needed Jesus. And so Jonas says, and that man that Thomas needs, brothers and sisters, that one man is the man, and the man only. That man is Jesus Christ. And if you want to feel happy, all you got to do. If you want to feel loved, all you got to do. If you want to feel safe, if you want to feel strong, if you want to walk tall, all you got to do, all you got to do, all you got to do is get saved and thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. To have things go right, all you got to do is get saved, says Jonas Nightingale in the movie. Let's look at Ephesians for a second. Everybody pull out your Bibles. I still like to say that because the next time, yeah, you brought that with you, right, Chris? The next time one of us Lutherans brings their Bible to church will be the first time probably. Those of you who didn't grow up Lutheran and grew up 
some other traditions, you're like, you bad Lutherans. So you can pull out your bulletins where we printed it out for you, making it easy for you. Ephesians 2, Paul talking about getting saved. Though, um, let's just clarify, the language that he talks, that he uses when he says get saved, are, is language like one new humanity, or reconcile both groups to God, or both of us have access to one spirit in the Father. Let's take a look at this passage from Ephesians. He starts out by saying, or using this word Gentiles, and in Paul's day, Gentiles simply means everybody who wasn't a follower of Jesus or a Jewish person. So like all of the other people. So he says, you all were Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision. And every Jew and every follower of Jesus in those days, um, like the number one sign of being a faith person was circumcision. It was a really big deal then. And this is a tough one for us now because it isn't so much the identifying mark of Christians or Jews any longer. But it was then. So going back 2,000 years, put our heads on in that way. So there is this physical difference between the circumcised, the in, and the out, the uncircumcised. And there's a big debate among the early, early church about whether you had to be circumcised. Details we won't go into now. But suffice to say, there's two groups of people here, the in and the out. And so Paul says in verse 12, Remember, you, the Gentiles, the uncircumcised, the out, you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, from God's people all along, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So here we are, Jonas Nightingale, you who need to be saved. This is those people. You are the out, the ones that need saved. All you need to do, all you got to do, all you got to do, right? Verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once were far off, you have been brought in by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made, wait, who has made? He has made. He has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. Verse 15, he has abolished the law with his command, with its commandments and its ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace. And he might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death hostility through it. And he came and proclaimed peace to you who were once far off and to peace who were once near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you outsiders, you who all you got to do is get saved, You Gentiles, you uncircumcised, you them, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the house of God, built upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets with Jesus as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together spiritually into one dwelling place for God. Okay, after all that, You've got the outsiders, the Gentiles, the them, the uncircumcised, and you've got the insiders, the circumcised, the believers, the, the church of Christ, Israel. How do you get to be an outsider and then be an insider? What do you have to do? All you've got to do is get saved. What is the thing? It's an easy answer. Do you believe, have to believe in Jesus? Or does God, the one that makes it happen, The beauty about Paul and about these words is that work, which we always like to say as Christians, I mean, this isn't something now, but this has been a long-held tradition for us Christians, and we as people, when things happen in the world, we like to say that we cause them to happen. We want to know how you get to do something. If you got a job, you want to know how you got it, right? If you get sick, you want to know the origin so you can treat the thing. And we like a systematic approach to things. We want to know how things happen. We want to be responsible for things when they happen. But Paul doesn't see salvation as being like that. To be in Christ, to be part of Israel, to be part of the church, to move from Gentile outsider, the uncircumcised, to the inside, shockingly, isn't something that we do. 
It isn't something we claim. It isn't something we demand for ourselves. We don't say to God, make me an insider. It's not something we accept or claim or mentally cognate. We don't make ourselves go from outsider to inside. It is God's work. But now, verse 13, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought in. The language of being brought in isn't something that we do. Bernard, if I went outside where you were and said, come on in, I'm going to bring you in, that doesn't sound like something that you did. For he is our peace. In his flesh, not ours, not our words, not our thinking, not our praying, in his flesh he has made both groups one. He has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. Isn't that beautiful language? Isn't that hopeful language? But there's a part of all of us that says, yes, it is, but it's uncomfortable language. Because we, in the end, at least many of us, myself especially included, are control people. I want to have control of stuff. I've often said, maybe to some of you, I have an issue with the first commandment, letting God be God. I like to be God, or at least think that I am. It's all an illusion. I like to think that I'm in control. I like to think that I'll dictate how God will work. I don't like to let God be in charge because sometimes it seems like things are kind of out of control. And if God is God, God's kind of out of control. It's a difficult step for us to let God be in charge, to let God be in charge of our salvation because we like to be in control. But what would it look like if we are the kind of people that allow God to be in charge? What would it look like if we were the kind of people that were simply content recipients of grace? Because if we are, it changes everything, doesn't it? I mean, rather than spending our energies on trying to save people, to change people, to convert people, we could spend our energies on being people who are modeling lives already being saved, For example, what would it look like to be a people who aren't telling the world that they need to be saved? Rather, what would it look like to be a people who are telling the world that they are already saved? And that this is what it looks like to be people living that life already. May you be a a people, a person and a people, that know you are loved by God And that is your message to everybody else. Amen.